Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to a new episode of Great Minds on Learning. In this series, Donald Clark, the internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning, from the Greeks to the geeks. This episode takes us back to the very earliest group of thinkers this series will cover, the ancient Greeks. At the very origin of our ideas about learning, as well as so much else that defines our culture, lies the extraordinary flowering of thought and discovery centred on Athens from the 5th to the 2nd century BC. On a wall of Chalkwell Station facing the Thames Estuary in South End on Sea, where I grew up in the 1960s, someone had painted a slogan in letters that were as tall as I was at the time. You couldn't actually see it as you were walking along the path by the back of the station. You had to swim out to sea to see it, which I did. And what it said was, when the mode of the music changes, the walls of the city shake. This is the title of an album by psychedelic band The Fugs who got it from Allen Ginsberg, the beat poet, in a 1961 essay, who claimed to have got it from Plato out of Pythagoras. Two of our great minds, this episode. This is just one very small example. I could cite a whole shed load from popular culture, the way that the thought of ancient Greece permeates us still to this day, from the Simpsons or Succession recently. In fact, when you read the history of ancient Greece and try to put yourself imaginatively into that world and have to try and conceive what a world before the Greeks was like, it's, you find it's almost impossible. They taught us to think the way we think now. So it's kind of hard to think past them. There's so much a part of us, it's hard to step back and see how radical a break with the old world they brought about. It really was extraordinary. At the same time, their world is radically different from ours in many respects. It was a slave-owning culture. Uh, If Plato and Aristotle were alive today, they would get roasted on Twitter for their views on women, quite rightly, and other things as well, uh, such as um, whether it's okay for adults to have sex with children. Aristotle's views about a whole range of things from spontaneous generation to light just seem played wrong to us now. And yet, Their influence on us has been extraordinary, and especially in learning. Donald, I know you want to start introducing us to the Greeks with that famous painting of Raphael's, The School of Athens. Uh, This will work better for the uh, people who who are following this on YouTube. Um, So paint us a picture of the Greeks, Donald, and perhaps you can start by describing that painting. Sure, John, yeah. I think it's a great starting point when you're looking at the Greeks, which is, you know, people go to the Vatican Museum and they head off to the Sistine Chapel. But merely a few steps from the door is, for me, a superior work. Uh, the Sistine Chapel is about, this, you know, a myth, the story of Genesis. But uh, the School of Athens, written by, a, 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 which is a fresco uh, rather than a painting, uh, uh, reflects the whole, this is a Renaissance looking back at the Greeks and other intellectual figures, this rebirth of knowledge that was already there in the ancient world. It's a beautiful, monumental fresco. And it's all set within a school, which is why I think it's uh, it's relevant. And there's a label above the fresco that says, uh, Cosarium Cognitio, and that idea, in other words, we're looking for causes here. Raphael's looking back going, "What, what is the roots of this intellectual tradition that we're picking up on now and giving rebirth to renaissance, which is exactly what it means. And the whole painting just says, why? How did we get here? You know, and the whole thing represents what we now know is that's a liberal tradition in learning, well, at least within religious boundaries, Galileo came a cropper on that one. There were still boundaries there, very definitely. But this notion of intellectual inquiry, debate, discussion, that sweeps through to the Enlightenment is all is all there in this one beautiful fresco. But let me do a wee bit of detail here because uh, we paint the picture as it were. Bang in the middle of the arch are two major figures, Plato on the left, Aristotle on the right. And Plato, who, who really built the first university, the academy, is standing there pointing upwards to to heaven, as it were, because he was the idealist, the rationalist, the theory of forms, the metaphysician. Aristotle has his hand horizontal, almost looking down to the earth. He's saying, calm down here. This is about empiricism. It's about evidence. 
Uh, he's the scientist of the pair, the pair. He also had a school called the Lyceum, of course. So at one point into the sky, the other was hand level palm down into the real world. Now, these two philosophical traditions, the Platonic and Aristotelian, come right through the Middle Ages, Plato through St. Augustine, uh, and Aristotle through Aquinas into the Catholic Church and so on. An enormous influence on religion, even although they were neither, of course, neither of them were Christian in that sense. Uh, interestingly, Plato holds a Timaeus, a book in his hand, and Aristotle holds his ethics. Again, this distinction between uh, a, the Platonic idea, two schools of thought. One, Plato is a rationalist, uh, you know, looking at inquiry for root causes, whereas Aristotle in his ethics is looking at the real behavior of real people in the real world. So you get that distinction nicely, even in the fresco. But there's another figure in the fresco. If you look over to the left, he's not even looking out at the painting. He's busy, deep in conversation with a group of young people, and that's Socrates. Now, he's dressed in green, which was the secular color uh, that re uh, represented the secular uh, tradition mm -hmm. in the Renaissance. And he has no interest in anybody else around about him. He's deep in dialogue and thought with these young uh, young men. And of course, Socrates, one of the young men is looking across at Plato because it was through Plato that we get Socrates. Socrates never wrote a single word. It all came through the Platonic dialogues. But he's there as a major figure. Raphael recognizes this. He's the skeptic, the critical thinker. You know, uh, his educational approach is deconstruction through dialogue, stripping away preconceptions. Uh, that idea of, you know, exposing people's ignorance. Actually, you know, his fundamental belief was that we think we know, but we don't really know. We're far stupider or ignorant than we think we are. And he doesn't conform to any of these traditions around him. And I like that because that's. That, that tradition of critical thought has, has survived to this day. He would have no time with lectures in universities, for example. It's all dialogue, feedback, reflection, deep thought. Now, I think there's another big thing injected into this amazing fresco, and that is many of the figures have interesting faces. So Plato, for example, actually has the face of Leonardo da Vinci. Raphael does something fascinating oh. here. He sort of mixes up. The, these scientists, philosophers, astronomers, mathematicians, with real people who were the artists of the day. So Donatello's in there, San Gallo, Leonardo da Vinci, even Raphael puts himself into the picture. So we have this lasting theme in the painting, uh, Fresco, about the role of the arts and all this. But there are also people like Zoroaster and Averroes, Arab thinkers, you know, the, the mm. Renaissance was really, you know, came to us through the Arab tradition. That's how many of these texts survived. Interestingly, about learning technology in the painting itself, I did actually a count of this once, and there's a scroll, there's about eight, nine books being held by people, a couple of tablets, one which has uh, a, a Pythagoras' uh, theory of numbers representing, representing music. Well, a couple of people quills galore, ink pots are all over the place, even two people holding globes, and Euclid has a giant set of calipers or compass. So it's full of sort of technology of the day, as it were. Uh, and there's another interesting group there, the mathematicians. So we have Pythagoras, bottom left. Mm. Euclid is a main figure, bottom right. So Raphael is recognizing that from these two immense figures, Euclid and Pythagoras, we get this mathematical tradition. But just to end there, there's a, sorry I've gone on, I'm obviously obsessed by this fresco. There is a figure right, in the, right at the front who's sitting there in a moment in thought. He's clearly pained. Many commentators think this is Michelangelo, who was literally painting the Sistine Chapel a few steps away from Raphael when he was painting his fresco. They were working exactly the same time. Mm. Knew each other, of course. But that moment is actually... Not Michelangelo, he's got Michelangelo's features and face. It's actually Heraclitus, another Greek philosopher. Now, Heraclitus is unusual because yeah. his philosophical theory is that everything is in flux and change. And this is what Raphael is saying to us, that knowledge changes, science changes, things progress, things are not fixed and finite. Learning is not, here's a body of knowledge, I'm going to, I'm going to, deposit in you, the learner, as if you were a bank. You know, this is a changing intellectual landscape. That's why I think it's a work of absolute genius. Hmm. 
Very interesting. And what what's coming across there in, you know, you think of the Renaissance, it's so interesting that such great geniuses were working in very similar time and place together. Similarly, in that doubling with ancient Greece, as as we go through, I think the timeline comes out, all these people kind of overlapped each other in their dates. They were around at the same time and, yes. you know, uh, they, they were pupils of each other and, and, and so on. And yes. interesting what you say about progress. Stephen Fry, for, for what it's worth, says the uh, Greeks invented progress. So if you look at Egyptians, uh, you can go to two Egyptian temples that are built 2,000 years apart and they look almost exactly the same. The Greeks invented the idea that you would progress from generation to generation and, and, and things moved. You know, Heraclitus can't put your foot in the same river twice yeah. and so on. Let's start with Socrates, a Greek philosopher from Athens who is credited as the founder of Western philosophy and among the first moral philosophers. He authored no texts, as you said. He was described as unbelievably ugly, careless of his appearance uh, and, and perhaps even filthy. He loved the city, loved the city of Athens. He was the first great fanatical lover of the city among intellectuals and a, a long tradition after that from Walter Benjamin to Fran Leibovitz, perhaps, about New York. And Socrates would walk about the streets of Athens talking and debating with anyone he met. His philosophy was about using reason and logic to study people rather than things, I think. And he turned convention upside down. He would literally argue that black was white. Um, but his ugliness is significant. He, he was, there, there is a story that he was at a, a dinner party once, sitting next to a very good-looking chap, and managed to convince him through argument that actually he, Socrates, was the better looking. You know, my nostrils are hugely flared, which means they can take in more oxygen than you. My ears stick out at an odd angle, and that means I can hear more than you. Um, he would literally argue that black was white, very much the Socratic method. And he's responsible for that uh, T-shirt slogan, which um, actually is quite obnoxious if you think of the divisions that a university education brings. The unexamined life is not worth living. Uh, I think a lot of people who've been to university and didn't bother to hang around for the exams would um, dispute that. <laughs> Several in my family. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert. He, he died through enforced suicide, um, drinking hemlock, was made to take hemlock by the, by the city of Athens. Hardly a spoiler at all, in fact, because this is one of the most iconic deaths in the whole of culture. I, I was just saying before we started, Donald, that you could easily do a whole podcast series about the death of Socrates, how the, the things that led up to it, the results of it, how it resonates through um, art, music and, and culture. It, it's one of the great deaths. Questioning was central to his method. In your blog, you write, Donald, the aim of learning was to pursue with a ruthless intellectual honesty answers to difficult questions. <sighs> How much that is like our own inquiry here. Learning for Socrates was all about asking the right questions, which sort of puts me on my mettle as the one asking the questions here. I'm afraid I'm just going to have to bottle it because the, uh, the, the strain of, of living up to that is too great. Donald, just tell us about Socrates. Okay. Well, there is this figure I mentioned in the fresco who is standing apart and alone, and he is a singular figure in the history of thought. Uh, he, I, it was interesting you said he would argue that black was white. I think he'd argue that neither black nor white even existed. He would go that far. And it's quite difficult reading Socrates because it's almost painfully deep and logical. It's actually quite difficult to read the Platonic Dialogues uh, because they are so rigorous following his line of thought and the line of thought of the people he's talking to, is quite tricky. But there are two Socrates. There's a Socrates that comes to us through Plato, who is the one everyone knows. There's another Socrates that comes through Xenophon, where he paints him in a, a rather duller light. He's a bit of a dull moralizer who almost bullies and beats young people over the head with his intellect in the Agora. Uh, nevertheless, this is an, an outstanding thinker, you know, uh, clearly who massively influenced both Plato and Aristotle. But Everybody knows the Socratic method, maybe you've heard of that, but you know, if you've probably read a lot of the Socratic dialogues or, or might be able to pin it down, but it is worth pinning down because he has a theory of learning here. Uh, first of all, you know, he, dis he himself described it as a uh, himself as a midwife giving birth to thoughts in the learner. 
This is fundamental to him. His mother was actually literally a midwife, interestingly. But this notion of the student giving, being encouraged to give birth to their own thoughts is the premise behind his method. Okay, The ideas are, be are, are always best generated through the cognitive effort of the person who's learning. And we know that a lot of that is true, that all this theory and books like Make It Stick on about effortful learning. You know, you really, learning is hard. You've got to make the effort or it won't stick and you won't get that deeper processing and understand, understanding. The education isn't about, you know, open your mouth, I'm going to pour this knowledge in as in a lecture. It's a drawing out, you know, it, it, uncovering all the, especially pre, the premises or preconceptions you might have about a subject. It's often about destroying them because they're often superficial. So the learner is more likely with Socrates to discover that he didn't know something than he did or he or she did know something that are actually in a state of ignorance. I think the best example of this is probably Descartes. You know, this comes through, Descartes sits back and goes, what do we, that great philosophical question, what do we actually know? What can we say we know mm. with certainty? Now he says, well, the world, look around you. Well, this might be a grand illusion. You know, it might literally be a simulation or whatever we might call it these days. It might be completely, uh, completely fallacious. And he said, do you know that even that other people exist? They might simply be auto automatons, you know, or robots in some, sometimes. And then he, he strips things back and back and back until the only thing you know is that you exist. I think, therefore, I am cogito ergo sum. So this Socratic tradition lives on through this critical, rigorous, sceptical thinking about the world, which has given us, you know, given us so much, really. It's, it's given us the civilization and modernity as we know it. And he, he claims that he didn't teach anything, actually. You know, he just, he was, he just taught people to generate their own opinions, come to their own conclusions, and, and so on. But I thought it was, there's another great work in Greek tradition. That's drama, of course. Not only do the Greeks give us philosophy, mathematics, <laughs> all this stuff, they give us, they invent drama <laughs> in such a magnificent way. And, and Aristophanes, in his comedy, Clouds, which is full of fart jokes, <laughs> interestingly. It's quite yeah. a bizarre read. Aristophanes is all full of fart jokes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he, he paints Socrates as a rather ridiculous figure. And, and, you know, what he does as a dramatist, of course, is paint Socrates as somebody who's just, a, a, you know, a petty, hair-splitting logician who isn't really, yeah. who's, whose thought is completely unrelated to the, to the real world. Yeah, and isn't that where we get the isn't that where we get the saying "Cloud Cuckoo Land" that actually comes it from that play? Yeah, the, yeah. The, the Cloud Cuckoo Land thing's interesting. They literally had mechanical devices, like big clouds floating about, people coming in on 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 the end of big A-frames on ropes and stuff. It was very very sophisticated. Uh, mm. it, 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 Clouds, I mean, when you read Clouds now, the jokes are obviously very different. It's not as funny as you might think, but yeah, it's, it's quite hard work, Aristophanes, because it's just unfunny yeah. <laughs> you know, in, in, a, in a big way for us now. The jokes are very laboured and, you know, to yeah. understand them, you have to kind of explain them. And by the time you've understood them, you're not laughing. Yeah. Although I did, I, I did see Clouds once in the Edinburgh Festival, one, one of these student productions. Actually, it was quite good because a lot of it's a bit like slapstick humour. You know, you have to see it. For, it's all in the performance rather than the words. Yeah. yeah but but yeah. then again, but I think you're still fundamentally right. It's a different culture, a different context, you know, it's... Humour was a very different thing, yeah, you're right. Yeah, we did an Aristophanes play at, at, at school, I remember, and what worked best was that the, the, they had Aeschylus and debating with, I think, Dionysus. And Dionysus was dressed as a kind of rock star in a spangly suit, and Aeschylus was in a military uniform. And th when you actually staged the thing, it, it kind of made sense, you know, yeah. the way it was sending up these the, yeah. these people. But it, but it, it, it's sort of hard work, it's not that funny. Yeah. An interesting thing with regard to Socrates here, and this comes through as we'll, we'll probably hear about later in Plato. Plato was deeply suspicious of drama and poetry and fiction yeah. in terms of learning and education. Okay. Deeply suspicious of it because he thought it was species, <laughs> uh, specious uh, almost. And Socrates had a similar view here. Socrates was, you know, all about relentless intellectual honesty. You know, this getting down to really deeply discussing difficult, difficult questions. You know, what is justice? What is good? What is beauty? Are these big, big topics? He wasn't mucking around here, you know. He didn't want to mm. entertain us in any sense. Uh, the, this realization surfacing of our own ignorance. And I think, you know, it, it, it's Socrates, not Aristophanes, and 
Socrates, Plato and Aristotle who have fueled learning culture more than perhaps Aristophanes, let's say. Although the dramatists, especially the Greek tra tragedians, uh, you know, people like Sophocles and uh, Euripides and Aeschylus, I mean, that tradition lives on and is magnificent because that's about facing up to the horror of the world, which is as relevant now as it was then. But Socrates is this massively influential person, you know, uh, hugely influential. People like Roger Shank had a company called, uh, you know, a, a, I think it was Socratic Learning, which is all about search-based inquiry, you know, allowing people to build a business if you're going to learn about business rather than going to business mm. school and doing case studies and listening to lectures. And, of course, now we're in this age now that's very Socratic, I think. If you go onto Google and search for something, you quite often, if it, if it finds something, fine, it'll tell you. But if it doesn't, it quite often gives you another set of questions, you know, just below it now. Mm. Google has turned into sort of Socrates of the age now. In other words, they say, well, you know, might, we might not have found what you want here, but maybe these other questions are maybe hit the mark a little bit more. And you find you're, you're into a dialogue. Uh, this is true in adaptive learning yeah. systems, which are highly personalized. You know, you're going through a learning experience, and suddenly you find you're actually engaged in this dialectic with a system. Which is which starts to get quite a, to know about you as a person. It's quite interestingly Socratic, mm. I think, as well. So I think the technology is catching up with Socrates. Just that platform Quora, Quora, which is completely questions driven. That's right. That's a very good example. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to say that Socrates would be absolutely appalled if he looked at modern sort of you know schooling and training. Uh, you know, he wasn't an institutional figure, of course, but. The idea that we have these this immutable knowledge that we sort of throw at people in PowerPoints would have been ridiculous to him, you know. Mm. Uh, the unexam uh, the, the unexam unexamined life may not be living. That's a phrase that, that, that comes later from someone else. But uh, but neither is a life of absolute mm. certainty. This idea that you know you're you're picking up on stuff and ramming it down people's throats would have been an anathema to Socrates. And but of course, as you rightly mm. said, if we if we behave like Socrates in the in training or in a modern school, we'd be sacked on our first day for, we'd be cancelled on day one for bullying. <laughs> Pederasty, yeah. of course, uh, quite famously, uh, not sticking to the curriculum, failing to prepare students for the exams, all that stuff, you know. We, he would have nothing to do yeah. with the system as, as we know it. Not to mention sloppy dressing. It, may, it maybe follows in that tradition of, you know, the 1960s hippie almost. You know, he cared not a jot for how he yeah. dressed or how he appeared. In fact, made a point of it almost. Roger Shank was influenced by Socrates, but before him, other people were as well. And the first person to really massively be influenced by him was his pupil, Plato. And Plato is the way that we know most about Socrates. Uh, he was an Athenian um, from around 428 BC to around 348 BC. This does my head in being not particularly numerate. All the dates go backwards. Um, and also they're all circa because nobody quite knows for, for, for definite. But Plato was an Athenian pupil of Socrates, founded the Platonist school of thought and a school called the Academy, as you mentioned, perhaps the first higher education institution. And he founded it to teach people to think like Socrates. He was a, an uber fan, a stan, if you like. Um, mainly, if we've got to kind of sum up what it was about, he tried to formulate the ideal society. He wrote 36 books, which is a lot to survive, all imaginary dialogues, Socrates always with a starring role. Uh, most famously, The Republic, The Symposium, which I had a crack at, The Laws, The Mino, The Apology. According to Alain de Botton, he had four big ideas. Uh, know yourself, let your lover change you, decode the message of beauty, and reform society. Uh, within each one of those, you could unpack it. His, his work is huge and incredibly important, all of it. Um, interesting distinction with uh, people who came later, perhaps the world's first utopian thinker. Um, and there is the uh, Plato's uh, allegory of the cave. Uh, uh, so we get platonic forms from that, the world of ideal forms. He had reservations about democracy because people didn't think properly before they voted. Not that that ever happens nowadays. He thought we should be ruled by philosopher kings and they'd had to be at least 50 before they could um, get into power. Um, so it wasn't at all that mad about democracy. And, and, and 
perhaps in consequence now a big figure with the um, with the American right. Donald Plato is an enormous figure in our culture, um, but what specifically did he bring to learning? Yes, it's a towering intellect. You know, Whitehead described all philosophy as footnotes to Plato. Uh, but in stark contrast to Socrates, whom he uses in his Platonic dialogues, he thought he had certainty about things in a way that uh, Socrates certainly did not. And you rightly said he was quite utopian. He, his belief was in pure reason. You know, he's the, he's the big rationalist. Uh, but that comes with a bit of a contempt for the real world. If you believe in mathematics and reason, then a contempt that comes with a sort of contempt for the real world, which is which led him towards, you know, a, a, an educational theory that was focused on the elite. So this guy's quite scholastic, abstract, unworldly, as it were. Uh, you rightly said he, he he ran his academy for nearly nine hundred years, which is in a longer than almost every university that that even exists now, until it was closed down by Justinian, yeah. uh, you know, in about sixth century AD or so. But the uh, also a really interesting thing about his school, let's call it a school, a quasi university. Above the gate, he had the phrase "Do not enter here unless you know geometry." And I was he really did as mm. he was a rationalist. He had a great faith in geometry in particular, but mathematics generally. But you, the question you asked John was, "What influence has he had on learning? What was his learning theory, as it were?" And he was very prescriptive. Mm. We have the first major learning theorist in Plato because he writes down in great detail in the Republic and some other works about what education or learning should be and how it works. Okay, so first of all, he did, although he was a great fan of mathematics, he didn't want to throw maths at young children too early. He thought that was completely counterproductive. He would have hated the whole PISA thing or teaching kids maths in primary school. He thought, and in fact, he was very specific. He thought it it led to the rejection or a sort of rebelliousness about the subject, which I think is true. Certainly, in my case. <laughs> yeah, well, in the case of most people, I mean, most people are turned off maths because they get too much. Quite absolutely, they don't see the relevance of it, and it seems very odd. Too much, too early, as it were. Uh, so you yeah. know, we we can paint Plato as this sort of you know this sort of odd character, but this is quite li that's quite a liberal thought in many ways. But he was also quite famous for something that might shock a few people, that he completely rejected the teaching of fiction at an early age, you know, literature, poetry, drama, all the stuff that Greek mm. society was soaked in. He thought this was incredibly dangerous. The no re he, he would have no time with people who think that education is all about storytelling. You know, he has some really salutary warnings about this, you know, that, and he's very specific in terms of the psychology of learning as to why it's bad for a child, that it clouds the, the child's mind. You know, it reduces their ability to make judgments and deal with the real world because they, they latch on to, they see people pretending to be other people. And that, that, that too much absorption of fiction uh, led to self-deception. You know, believing what other people think mm -hmm. has a big emotional impact on you. But is that emotional impact good necessarily? And, uh, and the temptation also to emulate some immoral behavior, which was certainly true in a lot of the comedy we discussed in, uh, <laughs> you know, that was highly sexualized, a lot of this stuff, uh, Greek theater. Yeah. So I think he was a, a, a skeptical, a skeptical about, about fiction. It's interesting, I read a book recently called The Story Paradox that picked up on this. You know, it, it, it wasn't that how can we change the world through stories, this guy called Jonathan Gottschall said, how can we save the world from stories? You know, we get this tsunami <laughs> of narratives through streaming, you know, especially during COVID. But maybe that's not such a good thing mm. that we, we're actually deluding ourselves into thinking that the liberal orthodoxy or whatever set of beliefs we have, have come through reason. Whereas we get bombarded with storytelling that just reinforces that all the time. And that we mm. tell, you know, storytelling is about confirming our convictions rather than rather than opening things up, up that are, are new. But that was, that was Plato's view. You know, he, you, know, you know, he cautions us against that, which is an interesting and quite counter-culture thing in, in the modern age. Yeah, it's interesting how the Socrates and Plato kind of sets philosophy up in opposition to drama. These, you know, two very big strands of um, Greek culture that both come, come down to us differently. And, it yeah. never occurred to me that the two were actually warring, as it were. You know, Plato was saying, watch out for those people. You know, yes. very attractive, but they're just filling your head up with cotton wool. 
Hey, that, that's exactly it, yes. Uh, you know. oh, and, and of course, there's another big strand here in the Greeks, which I think is often missed and not, not played too, too, so much these days. That's that learning was to do with mind and body. And I was the Greek ideal, which is explicit in, in statuary, for example, which we can, which you oh, know, yeah. we're all familiar with those beautiful bodies. Uh, and, and so the gymnasium, which was a separate place, was also a sort of school. Remember, the, mm. the Olympic Games ran for a thousand years. Imagine that, over a thousand years. Yeah. And it was hugely popular, as popular as it is now, if not, you know, not more. Hugely popular, yes. Oh, yeah. I, There's a Latin phrase for this, isn't there? Men sana corporum sano, a healthy mind and a healthy body. Did correct. that come from the Greeks? Yes, that's right. And the the... A gymnasium literally means a school for naked exercise. You know, it's literal meaning. And there was a, but there's this combination of, you know, you got schooling. There was philosophical discussion, lectures, all sorts of things, reading of literature, also in the gymnasium. But the ideal of body and mind they didn't have that much of a this massive distinction between the two. Was a, a huge hmm. strand in Greek thought, and so you were, you yeah. know. They paid really serious attention, especially to military training at age 18. As I say, the Olympic Games are 1,000 years. Imagine the Premier League lasted for 1,000 years. That would mean the first game had taken place during the reign of Alexander, the, uh, of uh, Alfred the Great. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that long. Wow. It's a mind-blowing yeah. idea, really, that the modern Olympic Games is a mere sort of, you know, tenth of that, only, only be going for a century or so. But yeah. I, 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 I forgot to pick up on something you said earlier, which is, uh, education was about preparing people for adult life. The child is clearly mm. not capable of sound reasoning, uh, which is why you have to protect them from the sort of harmful fictional cultural influences when they're when they're early. But at about eighteen or twenty-one, Plato thought that you introduce philosophy uh, a bit later at thirty, but really reason, mathematics, that sort of stuff. You know, you get going at eighteen between 18 and 21, mm. which is the sort of modern undergraduate kickoff point as well, I suppose. But it's only at 30 do you get philosophy, and only at 50 do you allow any anyone anywhere near politics in terms of ruling over others. He was mm. sceptical of democracy, certainly, because he thought it was uh, driven by mass impulses, which not reason. And he thought he had this idea of the philosopher kings, people like him, of course, uh, should rule, but the the age, the minimum age was fifty. I think there's some sense in that. You know, let's have some people who are some grounded in real experience, uh, yeah. who are qualified, yeah. intellectually smart. I think. Uh, so he'd like people like Biden who'd been around a while. Uh, yeah, I think that I think that may be going too far. I think you know, I think when you get into your eighties, I think Plato would probably, well, probably anybody who lived until their eighties in Greek times, uh, that that would have been probably as concept for him. Okay. But it's very hard to avoid getting onto politics with the Greeks because they kind of invented politics as well. <laughs> yes, they did. But um I, th I suppose we ought yeah. to stick to the stick to the learning side. So moving on from Plato and the the idealist to the empiricist, I suppose. Aristotle 384 BC to 322 from Macedonia, which is in the north of Greece, uh, studied at the academy. He was Plato's pupil. So he was Socrates' pupil's pupil. It's really interesting that there is this line, very direct line of su succession between these three enormous intellects. And he was the only Greek, Aristotle, who wrote more philosophy than Plato. After the death of Plato, he took a lucrative gig as tutor to the son of the king of Macedonia, uh, and this son was called Alexander, later known as Alexander the Great. Uh, after Alexander had conquered half the known world and died young, Aristotle went back to Athens and then he founded his own school, uh, the Lyceum. It's amazing how these names live on. There is a Soho dining club called the Academy and the Lyceum is a venue in London where I used to go and see punk gigs, I think. <laughs> well, Plato was an idealist. Uh, we, had, we talked about the Platonic forms. Aristotle was an empiricist, tried to make sense of what he observed. So rather than kind of starting with a rule and trying to fit observations into it, he started with the observations and then deduced principles from that. So knowledge proceeded, proceeded from the evidence of the senses, according to Aristotle. Very important because here we're at the birth of science, really. He studied nature. 
He established biology and zoology as fields of studies. His books include Metaphysics, On the Heavens, On the Soul, Physics, a prolific writer and a lot survives courtesy of Ar- Arabian scholars. So I, I first came across him when I did a, a course on aesthetics um, and uh, we, we read a load of stuff about um, how he believed that uh, vision was came from rays which were shot out from the eyes. And I remember thinking... Uh, what are you telling me, teacher? This is completely wrong. Why are we studying this stuff? He just got everything wrong. Um, but he defined a complete system that was the basis for how Europeans thought about the physical world for 2,000 years. His, his whole thing about the elements, earth, air, fire and water, um, comes through to the, to the the medieval age, the medieval humours and um, uh, people like Galen and, and so on. It, it, enormously um, kind of persistent in culture. In fact, um, you know, it has been said that uh, one of the things the Enlightenment did was to free us from the tyranny of all the wrong ideas Aristotle had put into the culture. Um, So, Donald, how do we how do we kind of put Aristotle into this, put him into context of the others? And what was his distinctive contribution, do you think? Hard with, again, somebody so big and so influential. But what's he mean for learning? Yes, going back to Raphael's fresco, we have Aristotle, the level-headed hand horizontal pointing down to the earth as opposed to Plato pointing up to the heavens, the metaphysician. And Aristotle is the consummate empiricist. And I was relying on what he sees on data, trying to understand the real and natural world. And of course, he got many things wrong. He also, interestingly, got many things absolutely right. So, yeah, uh, you, the, you know, but the important thing is his emphasis on, on data, the physical sciences, uh, the, investigating the world through observation knowledge based on, on your experience. And this is the legacy we have had. It actually died a death during, uh, you know, during the, the dark ages and through medieval world, because funnily enough, you have people like Aquinas who pick up on Aristotle and lock knowledge into scripture rather unfairly on mm. Aristotle. So Aquinas is the Aristotelian, the child of Aristotle who becomes the theorist for the Catholic Church, for example. So the, that would uh, that was a legacy that Aristotle would have abhorred. He would have hated the uh, mm. uh, hated that consequence. But going back to the sort of Greek ideal, because, you know, the, it's just, as you said, John, it's absolutely remarkable that these two intellects should have been around at the same time. I can, the only parallel I can think of is in Edinburgh with David Hume and Adam Smith and Rousseau visits and those Enlightenment thinkers. You know, that's the nearest we have to this. But for it to happen in one small city in Greece is truly astonishing, really. But I think it's, of course, this is a learning podcast, but let's so just like Plato, let's focus on the educational theory because he was a learning theorist as well. And he wrote a book called On Education. We only have fragments of it, but we can get a feel for what he thought about this. It's quite a contrast to Plato in many ways, although he did believe in this training both mind and body, fundamental Greek ideal, including debate, just like Socrates uh, and, uh, and Plato. He thought that music, science, and philosophy have a should be combined with all this. And he was big on character and ethical behaviour and training. Uh, you know, something that uh, we would put some emphasis on in schools, for example. Uh, and to understand, it's quite simple to understand Aristotle in this one because he has the golden mean or everything in moderation. I, I visited the Benedictine Abbey called Buckfast Abbey in Devon at the weekend. Yeah. And that's exactly what the Benedictines said. Benedict, that was the ruling Aristotelian phrase for him, everything in moderation. So, you know, that, and I think it's a, mm. it's a fairly good principle, actually. And he was also quite keen on doing, learning by doing anything we have to learn. We, you know, we, we learn by the actual doing of it is an Aristotelian phrase, echoing many a modern theorist about, you know, don't think that it's just sitting there listening to other people tell you what's true. You must start to think for yourself and apply this knowledge in the real world. Theory and theorizing is one thing. That's Plato. That's reason. Empiricism, science and investigation is another. That's Aristotle with this huge dose of moral education. I think an inter- mm-hmm. I think a thing you'd find interesting about Aristotle was his his fondness for music and education. He really did yeah. uh, think that music gave uh, helped 
it helped build your moral character. It was sort of good for the soul, as well as being a useful pastime. You know, mm. if you read the symposium, people are always sitting around drinking and listening to music. But yeah. it, you know, music, music for Aristotle is recognizing these different hues of emotion, is painting an emotional landscape for people, so that people can control and understand the emotional side of life. This is very interesting and quite yeah. sophisticated in terms of learning theory. Yeah. Yeah, they, I mean, various people, um, educationists over the over the years, have emphasised the importance of music. Um, I, I suppose drawing on Aristotle, and there it, it isn't. Am I right in thinking there's some kind of neurological research that shows that it it, it does kind of Im, improve intelligence and so on. But that thing of regulating the the emotions. I mean, part of the reason why people are very cherry about music is that it doesn't have any kind of unlike writing doesn't have any kind of literal fact-based sort of interface no. you are uh, working directly with feeling when you work with music it's about modulating and expressing and controlling feeling so music learning music learning to play an instrument uh it, it in some way allows you to 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 control and channel your feelings in a way that almost nothing else does i mean and, and that's seen as threatening by some and um an educational boon by others yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm using another thing in education because, you know, it's largely non-representational. It's not representing things in the real world. It's representing emotions. Yeah. Largely. Except perhaps for, you know, a romantic tradition, you know, Vivaldi, or, you know, you got, there's lots of music tradition that is a bit representational. But another interesting philosopher, if people are interested in this, is Schopenhauer comes along in the 19th century and thinks that music is gives us a glimpse into what he called the world, the purest form of non-representation. In other words, it, music, when we listen to music, we're tapping into the real basis of the metaphysical world. Uh, I, I spent a, a year studying uh, Schopenhauer in some detail. A fascinating man because he, put, he puts music at the centre not only of education, but metaphysics itself, <laughs> oh. which is an interesting one. But I think we should also remember that Aristotle we carried away with music and Aristotle. This is also the consummate logician. So in his prior analytics, uh, another te they come together in a big book called the Orga Organon. I mean, really, Aristotle sets the tone for logic and logic deductive reasoning, a specific form of logic, uh, through syllogisms, forms a logical argument, which were to set the mm -hmm. tone for learning for the next 2,000 years. So this form of logic, uh, later philosophical logic and mathematics, and through into AI and so on, this is the man who sets this in motion. And of course, it, the, the downside is, is it led to this hair-splitting logic of scholasticism, largely in the context mm. of the Christian church. On the other hand, it eventually bounces out of this into, you know, into the 17th, 18th century mathematics, into Boolean logic, which is the basis of all computing, which is the basis of artificial intelligence. Uh, so his legacy, his lasting legacy, Aristotle, is perhaps on that front in learning, recognizing that this stuff really matters. You know, we can learn, we can mm. go, it can take us far. I'd want to add a further thing as well, um, coming back to the arts, is the, the poetics are enormously yeah. important. Something you got massively right. Um, uh, many years ago, uh, a close friend of mine attended the Robert McKee uh, classes for, for would-be screenwriters. He, he, he was a filmmaker, wanted to learn how to write screenplays. Um, and I borrowed the notes because I was very interested in this because I thought I might do this myself. And um, they are absolutely full of the poetics, Aristotle's yeah. poetics. Um, and he, he, he comes up with this uh, concept, peripety, which is the, 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 the sudden turning of a scene. So, I mean, you, you see this in every film that you, you watch and particularly Game of Thrones, it was constant peripety. You know, you walk into a scene and it is somebody saying... Um, uh, I, I, I've come to, um, to, to, to take over your castle and to, to kill you all and let's negotiate peace, peace terms. And the person he's, he's talking to then says, ah, oh, yes, but I have you around it, surrounded and um, I've just poisoned you with the food you've eaten and you're all going to die. That's peripety, the, the yeah. turning of the scene. And it's absolutely how you get from kind of one 
moment to the next in writing a drama. And in the poetics, he absolutely nailed this. It, it, it's as relevant today uh, for anybody who's, who's, who's interested in kind of drama or, or, or any form of fiction for that matter, even non-fiction. It's quite remarkable that this one man, you know, not only invents uh, logical reasoning in it, as it was syllogistic reasoning, deductive reasoning, at the same time yeah. he invents aesthetics, <laughs> you know, or the yeah. philosophy of art. And there are, you can't go on a course in aesthetics without starting with the poetics and, and Aristotle uh, yeah. and, and the fundamental ideas he had. There's some, just like his science, which are, are, are wrong. Nietzsche gave a great critique of Aristotle, you know, the, the idea that the Greeks had that drama was about catharsis. Uh, and Nietzsche turns out in his head saying, no, it's the very opposite. It's about raising emotion, <laughs> it, 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 peaking it. You know, it's, it's not cathartic in any sense. But, the, it, but, but certainly that whole 2000, well, not a 2000 year tradition, literary criticism, the humanities in a modern mm. university are very Aristotelian and based on that approach he had to art through the poetics. That's absolutely right, John. Yeah. And, of course, the Aristotelian unities, which are still with us. Yeah. I was thinking of categories right. and logic and so on. That You know, this is a foundation of, of, of the type of science that emerges, classifications and so on, uh, in biology, zoology, and these other more empirical sciences. Next comes Pythagoras, who's... Uh, Biggest hit is the square on the hypotenuse is equal to join in if you know the words and and memorably that's in the Wizard of Oz uh, now the pop culture reference but but there is so much more to him than than just that um, a slightly confusing figure in a way born on the Greek island of Samos taught by is it Thales or Thales Thales a yeah, big Talus. defense contractor yeah. named after Thales yeah who was the first person to measure the height of the great Pyramid. I mean, brilliant measurers, the Greeks. They kind of measured yes. everything. And the way, the way that Talis measured the height of the Great Pyramid was brilliant. He knew how tall he was. Um, and he stood next to the pyramid and waited till his shadow was the same length as his height. And then at that moment, measured the shadow of the pyramid. <laughs> so from that, he could tell how tall the pyramid. It's just brilliant. I mean, this is so typical of kind of yeah. Greek thought. Um how, how do you do something you, you never thought it would, would be possible? But that's not Pythagoras, that's Talis, who, who taught Pyth Pythagoras. Um, not much is known about Pythagoras's life. Scholars disagree over what exactly can be attributed to him, and a lot of stuff is attributed to him. But nothing was written down uh, until 800 years later. Plato and Aristotle mentioned his followers and the way of life of his followers, but not a lot of his other thoughts. Um, around 530 BC, it seems, he travelled to southern Italy, where he founded a school in which initiates were sworn to secrecy and lived a communal ascetic lifestyle. There were religious rituals, dietary restrictions, living restrictions, vows of silence. I mean, it, after you joined the, um, what you have to call a cult, um, you, you would take a vow, vow of silence for, for a certain period of time before you were allowed to speak up. Um Discoveries in mathematics, philosophy, astronomy, and music theory, theory are all credited to him and to his school, but none of it is documented. So there's, there's a fair fuzziness around here. And what he seems to be chiefly known for is this rather cultish kind of cult leader. Some other discoveries, irrational numbers, reincarnation, metempsychosis, seems to be, uh, you know, it, 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 there's more foundation to attribute that to him than anything else, it seems. Um, he believed that all relationships can be reduced to numbers. Uh, there was this mystical figure 10 thing, the Tetractis. Heraclitus called him a charlatan. Um, he called himself a philosopher and was perhaps the first person to ever use that term about himself. Donald, what do you call him? Yeah. When I think of Pythagoras, the, the first thing that comes into my mind is that he was the first major vegan. <laughs> you know, he was a vegetarian. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that stuck, but it does, which it resonates with the modern age, I suppose, uh, for a lot of people. Uh, yeah. But I think you're right in describing him as a cult figure. Some people think he didn't exist at all. He was a bit of a mythical figure, but uh, he is certainly known mm. for Pythagoras' theorem, even although the Babylonians and Indians actually did know of that theorem before Pythagoras, but he certainly introduced it to the Greek world. And 
But even his mathematics was a bit odd. They had this mystical view of the number 10 as being significant because uh, yeah. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10. So he, th he thought this was mystical in some, some sort of way, had significance. Nevertheless, it's, it's perhaps more famously known in maths for uh, discovering the mathematical nature of the musical interv intervals having numerical ratios. ratios. So yeah. the theory of harmony, uh, harmonies as it's known, that's actually represented in Raphael's fresco. Uh, when you see Py uh, when you see Pythagoras and the bottom left hand in the front, there's actually a slate with the th with the uh, with that theory on the slate. So that's what he was known for in mm -hmm. Renaissance time. Uh, but it was an amazing discovery you know, that there was a mathematical sequence in music. It gives you an almost mm -hmm. philosophical view of music as we discussed earlier but it, you know he was a vegan he had all sorts of weird views that you had to put your right shoe on first and you weren't allowed to look over your shoulders backwards and th this was a commune really that he had <laughs> rather than a school mm -hmm. where people uh, went lived together ate together he even though he was a vegan he didn't believe in eating kidney beans didn't like beans because they were shaped like kidneys in the human body so all sorts of weirdness mm -hmm. to do with pythagoras but i think it's worth mentioning because of course, there are, these are the pre-Socratics, the people before Plato, so he, you know, it's 570 BC yeah. or so on, and there were lots of them. You know, we tend to think of that great triumvirate of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, yet there are a good, you know, 15, 20 figures before that who were investigative mm. scientists, really. Talus, starting with Talus, who you rightly said was mm. measuring the, the circumference of the globe, astonishingly. Uh, in the 6th century BC. Uh, we have others like uh, Heraclitus, Parmenides, uh, Anaximander, Anaximenes, and so on. So there are many pre-Socratics. Pythagoras, I think, is a relevant figure here because there's one big strand we're going to pick up on here from the Greeks, and that's mathematics. And he is known as, we've just described, uh, having discovered the mathemat mathematical nature of musical intervals, um, uh, Pythagoras' theorem. We have this so, uh, you know, almost uh, iconic figure in mathematics that comes from the Greeks, uh, although he didn't give us much in the way of mathematics if the truth was told, but he certainly places it in the curriculum. So when we, we'll maybe talk about this when it comes through to the, the, the medieval curriculum. Pythagoras is there. A more significant figure is perhaps Euclid, mm -hmm. who's about 300 BC, so he, mm -hmm. he's around when some of these figures in Athens, even though he, he lives in a Greek colony in Alexandria in Egypt, the famous library is. Uh, he's also in Raphael's fresco on the bottom right. So Pythagoras and Euclid get big billing in the fresco. Uh, the, the, the Greek triumvirate up at the back, right in the center of the picture, but the two main bodyguards, one on the right, one on the left, uh, are Pythagoras uh, uh, and Euclid. So we'd perhaps move on to Euclid if you wish. Okay, yeah. He's a Greek mathematician active in Alexandria, as you say. He might well have um, studied in the great Alexandrian library uh, during the reign of Ptolemy I, and often referred to as the founder of geometry. Uh, little known for sure about his life, again, um, some even conjecture. I think, as with Pythagoras, he never existed, but works were written by a team of mathematicians who used his name, perhaps as the flag of convenience in the case of Euclid. Nevertheless, his book Elements is one of the most influential works in the history of mathematics, including a system of rigorous mathematical proofs that remain the basis of mathematics 23 centuries later. The first ever algorithm appears in print here. So much to answer for, Euclid. At least five other works of his um, survived, covering perspective, conic sections, spherical geometry, number theory and mathematical rigour. Uh, Donald Euclid is obviously a really important moving force in the development of mathematics. Is he the one I should blame for having to suffer through maths at school? Yeah, perhaps. Uh, his, so the, the book you mentioned, The Elements, is actually 13 books, uh, quite small, but oh. were, were, it, perhaps the, easily the most successful test, textbook in the history of our species. Basically, this Greek text was still being used 2,000 years later in fact, was was still being used well into the 20th century. It was a foundation for the schooling of, uh, of geometry and mathematics. Uh, so the and the elements contains not only geometry but the concept of a mathematical proof. 
You know, so he, a proof would be, for example, uh, proving that all the angles inside a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Now, we may look at triangles and go, yeah, yeah that's right. But it's another thing to deduce and prove that it's true universally in all cases, just as he did with mm. Pythagoras' theorem. So this notion of not just deduction and syllogisms that Aristotle gave us, but the notion of mathematical proof, and also, as you mentioned, the algorithm. So... Uh, the first major algorithm print comes in uh, in in the elements and that's the cal calculation of the greatest common denominator for, for any number and uh, so he gives us the algorithm that's true in all cases for any number that's an algorithm so rigor and mathematical proof now a whole load of stuff on conic sections algebra a mixture of algebra and geometry uh, in this textbook that's only really been supplanted in the 20th century astounding figure. Uh, he also applied this mm -hmm. uh, through another book. We don't really have much, much knowledge. It's called uh, Phenomena. Phenomena. Uh, Mena, I think, yeah. Uh, that was applying geometry to uh, to spherical geometry, which ultimately leads, of course, to astronomy and the theories we know that come up through people like Tycho Brahe, Copernicus, and Ptolemy, and so on. So, we have Pythagoras, we have Euclid, who really goes to town and gives us a solid textbook on mathematics, which uh, is the key mathematical text for the next 2,000 years. And, of course, there were other figures on the back of this, especially in that part of the world, which is the Greek colonies. Some of these figures, especially pre-Socratics, came from modern-day Turkey. The Greeks were in southern mm -hmm. Italy, where many of the famous names came from. Uh, and we have people, uh, another one that's worth mentioning is Archimedes, uh, whom we can come on, on to next perhaps. Archimedes is another yeah. interesting figure. He gets around, he's all over the Mediterranean uh, and gives us another mm -hmm. angle in learning entirely. So Archimedes was a Greek mathematician, physicist, engineer, astronomer and inventor from Syracuse in Sicily, in the south of Italy, as you say. Um, and he gave us the Eureka moment. <laughs> yeah. Among other things, he anticipated modern calculus and analysis by applying the concept of the infinitely small and the method of exhaustion uh, to prove a range of geometrical theorems. That, that will me mean something to mathematicians uh, among the audience. Um, so a range of geometrical theorems included the area of the circle, the surface area and volume of a sphere, the area of an ellipse, the area under a parabola, the list goes on. Other mathematical achievements include deriving an approximation of pi, so pi we, we get coming in here, uh, defining and investigating the spiral that now bears his name, and devising a system using exponentiation for expressing very large numbers. He was, all of this stuff, absolutely foundational. He was also one of the first to apply mathematics to physical phenomena. So there's more of a kind of mechanical bent coming in in Archimedes. He's an inventor as well. Uh, founding hydrostatics and statics. Archimedes, uh, his famous screw, of course. Archimedes' achievements in this area include a proof of the principle of the lever, the widespread use of the concept of centre of gravity, which we now take for granted, and the enunciation of the laws of buoyancy, which is where we get the uh, eureka moment. The, the story I got at school on this, which may well be completely skewed and rubbish, is that he'd been set this problem um, to do with the, uh, weighing a crown or something. And uh, he was lying in the bath contemplating this uh, when he suddenly got the answer, when he saw the water spilling over the, the top of the bath, leapt out of the bath, uh, ran through the streets naked to tell his sponsor that he solved the problem of weighing the crown. Is, is there any truth in that, Donald? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, a, a, it's got an urban myth if, if urban life existed yeah. in those times. <laughs> but yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the displacement theory is interesting and attributed absolutely to Archimedes. So he puts the crown in a bowl of water. The displaced volume of water la lapping over the side is the volume of the crown. Brilliant. But he went, went one step yeah. further because he then divided the mass of the crown uh, 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 by its volume, and that determined whether it was silver or gold, because what the owner of the crown was interested in is whether it was debased metal or not. So uh, yeah. it, and this is a great thing about Archimedes. You know, the people we've discussed so far have really been interested in reason, science, mathematics. With Archimedes, you get this explosion mm. of practical 
application of all this stuff in the real world the the, the you know the displacement theory the eureka story that we've just told the invention of the archimedes screw i've seen these in egypt you know that are lifting water out the aisle they're they're used in modern day hydraulics for lifting water from one yeah. place to another compound pulleys that you see everywhere a, a fundamental thing in physics uh, you know and then uh, another thing yeah. like archimedes is that we forget that people like Socrates actually fought in the army. You know, they, they were fighting the Persians. This was a dangerous place to be at that time. These were warring city-states. Yeah. And so Archimedes not only invents these interesting agricultural thing, he invents all these war machines, including the one I love is this huge piece of glass that focused the sun's rays on the invading ships, which, which yeah. history tells us was actually used on invading Roman ships. Also, this huge crane and claw type thing that comes out, a bit like uh, on Brighton Pier, you know, you pick up the teddy bear. It had one of these claws that would go down and yeah. lift a ship out of the water and turn it over. <laughs> it's, it's a remarkable, yeah. uh, remarkable things. But, of yeah. course, the fundamental things were all that stuff in mathematics you described around circle spheres, parabolas, centres of gravity, levers. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you see you're the first technologist. Absolutely, yes. I think this would certainly be the case. The app application of knowledge science and reason to the creation of technology itself was his great achievement and we have plenty of evidence that he was uh, hugely successful at this uh, albeit in, mm. in, in the area of war but then again that was the, the life that these people were living. The one, one last thing I think that we missed out was he was quite famous also for his investigations into the number pi you know that that's the that's got yeah. an iconic status in mathematics, but we have an Archimedes, the first person who really investigates that figure in relation to calculating the uh, area of a circle volume of a sphere and so on. That that certainly uh, is one of his legacies. Uh, and you, you mentioned calculus. He, I think he really did. Calculus is a very interesting area of mathematics, but once you get the basic principle, and he, uh, Archimedes had this sort of method of exhaustion, or as you get ever smaller towards a target, by increasing the size of a polygon. So if you imagine a square that then becomes a hexagon mm. and a pentagon and octagon and increase the number of sides and it eventually becomes a circle. This is an Archimedean mm. concept coming towards the complete representation of a circle, which is the uh, you know a fundamental principle that heads towards calculus. So... Even the Greeks with the invention of calculus. It's just astounding how much how much these people covered in such a short period of time time. But fundamentally, yeah. you know, a mathematician who engineer technologist. That's a good good summarizing word, John. It was all for a purpose. So the defensive war machines he invented were to protect his native Syracuse from invasion. Um, yeah. kind of worked all that well, unfortunately. He was killed during the siege of, of Syracuse by a Roman soldier, even though um, he, the, the soldiers had been told that not, by, not to harm um, Archimedes because, he, you know, he, he was famous in his time as well. Yeah. Um, Dominic says, I, arguably the greatest of Greek mathematicians. Why is that, yeah. do you think? Well, I think that's right. I mean, the, the, the people we've been discussing here, Pythagoras, Euclid and Archimedes, I think... Interestingly, you might say technology. Another interesting word here is he invents engineering <laughs> as a science, the application yeah. of, uh, of mathematics in, in building machines, things, buildings. So engineering is, again, comes out of the Greeks, in this case, Archimedes. And I think that's, that's what we get here. We tend to think of the Greeks as rather abstract theorists because we think of Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, but it was a much wider spectrum of things they invented through to the arts, politics, engineering, technology, all of these things we've covered that shape the modern world and the modern curriculum, of course. Uh, I think one of the things that we've seen is perhaps taking it too far, I call it the maths Taliban. I think we've gone too far in a sense, I think, we see these PISA results. That, that, that was the first target, was how well the world's kids were doing in maths. I think that was a big mistake because politicians mm. have picked up on it and given it too much focus. They, they, they would have done well to have had a dialogue with Plato who warned against this, you know, force-feeding mathematics at too young an age without people understanding why it's relevant is a bit, was a mistake for Plato, a mistake that PISA and others have made.
that moves us on to summing up, really. These thinkers have been so influential on the subsequent history of Western thought. From time to time, they've had to be great efforts to disentangle us from teachings of theirs that have been widely accepted but turned out to be inimical to further progress or just plain wrong. Um, so, Donald, when it comes to learning, how do we characterise the legacy now in 2022 of the Greeks? Big question, I know, but you're up to it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's go, let's go back to the the fresco. You know, you you have this huge painting in the Renaissance. There is no Renaissance without the Greeks. The rebirth, which is what Renaissance stands for, is about the rebirth mm. of that way of thinking, which is why I went into some detail about the painting. You know, that Raphael wanted to get this across. Mm. This is a moving force pointing into the future, pointing to progress. And of course, the Greeks come through Plato, through St. Augustine, uh, Aristotle, through uh, Aquinas. The mathematicians come through uh, right into the Renaissance as well, helped by Arab scholars. But then we have this explosion, 16th century, of course, we have the Reformation. But around the time Raphael was painting this, a number of universities, especially in Italy, were being established across Europe. And this is really important because the Renaissance gave us this gift as well, places of learning of critical thought. They emerged from the guild system of it. It was quite complicated, this. But they, they had a wide curriculum, you know. They weren't just focusing on one or two things. It's not a liberal arts curriculum, really. Now, what, what the Greeks handed over here, and what, uh, what 16th century universities and earlier picked up on in places uh, like Bologna and Padua and Paris, was what yeah. they called the, the trivium, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. You know, they, they were the three big bases of this. And I was teaching people how to think for themselves. It might, the trivium might best be described in that way. And in the medieval period, that moved on to more interestingly, I think, the, a greater Greek influence. As all these Greek thinkers come through, you start having stuff taught like uh, uh, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, music, the quadrivium. The other, the, the next four on top of the original three of the trivium. And these seven liberal, liberal arts subjects were the basis of the university system and schooling as we know it to this day. It's still massively influential in all this. Now, the universities there then were very different and in some ways, I think, more admirable in many ways than what we have now. The system then was much more fluid and flexible. You actually paid to be taught by people. That's how ac academics made their money from fees largely paid directly from students. So you, they had to thrive on their reputation. Mm. They had to be good or wouldn't get paid. Their status as scholars and skills as a teacher were rewarded uh, by the students themselves. Students themselves hardly ever graduated, interestingly. It was only about two years normally. You, you, would, you, you would troop up. There were no entrance qualifications. The uh, Graduation wasn't really seen as a big deal then, really. It was going there, experiencing it for two years, and then coming out and making your way in the real world. That is what... Hmm. academe was then it's now got much more institutional in many ways but in summing up going back to the Greeks hmm. I mean what can you say it's profound two millennia lost long lasting many of the things that our children do in schools or the educational institutions that we some of us end up in uh, even on the practical side in engineering and vocational learning have these deep roots in Western culture, in the Greeks. Interestingly, we don't speak about the Romans much. You know, you, there isn't really a Socrates, Plato... What, and what did the Romans do for us? <laughs> yes, or not many famous Roman mathematicians, for example. So, uh, you know, so we suddenly have that a sort of deadening effect. You mentioned the, the Egyptians earlier on. You know, the Egyptian culture goes for 4,000 years, but it's a sort of death cult. It freezes, fossilizes everything. Mm. They have writing. But so do the Greeks, but they take it in a completely different direction in terms of this trajectory into the Renaissance, Enlightenment, and modern world as we know it. Uh, that's why it's such a, a wonderful story and why they're worthy of respect and reading and study. If you want to understand learning theory, if you want to understand our modern institutions and education, then you, you cannot ignore the Greeks. If you want to know the way that the world is, you have to look back at the past. And the Greeks really is the place where most of us start, I suppose, because literacy starts there. If you go back kind of another 400 years to Homer, that comes, as we, we've discussed before, that comes out of an oral tradition. Um, and the world really changes when things start to be written down. 
and the people who do the most to kind of shift and change it uh, with thought. Building this empire of thought really is is the Greeks, I, I suppose. I think that I think that's right. One thing we haven't mentioned is that one thing that gave the Greeks a huge lift was the alphabet. So the alphabet comes from mm. modern, uh, uh, well, modern day Syria. And I've actually been to this little town called Ur, U R, where the Greek alphabet ca- came, was invented, and seen the little tablet upon it, which it's stamped using a little reed into clay. It was, you know, it was miraculously survived because of a fire which baked the clay, that Greek alphabet comes into Greece. The alphabet is what gives the Greeks this boost in literacy because you can write with much greater Mm. ease. The alphabet never really developed in a fully phonetic form in Egypt, which held writing back. So suddenly we have in 750 BC, just, you know, 200 years before the people we're talking about, we have uh, Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey, this birth of writing, Mm coming out of an oral culture, writing becomes an obsession for the Greeks. Everything we've discussed Mm -hmm. survives because it was written down. And the fundamental piece of technology, writing was the big bang in learning technology. Alphabet was this huge rocket booster in culture because it made writing that much much easier to do and to read. Two components there. I'm just finishing off a book on the history of learning technology that goes back really to cave art, writing, printing, these big bang moments of fundamental pieces of technology that change the world forever. I think in a funny sort of way, learning technology is more fundamental than any other form of technology because it's what gives us everything else. There is no technology without writing, (laughs) you know, without pens, papers, teaching, learning. Learning technology is fundamental to all this. We tend to think of it just computers or whatever, but we forget that it's also Mm. all that technology, you know, back to Raphael's fresco. It's full of books, pens, pencils, the iconography of writing. This is how it survived, how it got to the Renaissance, to the Enlightenment and to us. Now I'm beginning to feel a bit of an end of term feeling now (laughs) as we get to the end of the, the second season. Um, perhaps to uh, extend an educational metaphor, like a teacher, I'd say, put your heads down on the desk and have a little rest if you've been following us throughout this season, because I think we've we kind of made quite demands on your 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 intellect with, with what we've done. But I, I, I hope everybody has got an awful lot for this, and I'm sure they'll be very thankful to you, as I am, Donald, for, for your work on this season. So um, thanks for this episode, but also for all the other episodes in this season, and we look forward to what comes next. Yeah, no, th- no thank you, John. You, you've been my Socrates, really. You, know, you sat there teasing this stuff out, you know, from the nooks and crannies of my, uh, my the washing machine that is my, my, my mind. But I, I think that's why these pod, I, you know, I've really, and really enjoyed doing these because in a way they're sort of true to the Socratic method, aren't they? You know, what we've been doing is precisely that, you know, just trying yeah. to dig deep into these groups of people that gave us this intellectual legacy are in learning theory. And, the, you know, the, it, it, it's, been a, it's been a great journey. So thank you, John. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. Sound edit is by Isaac Peacock. Social media by Jay Curtis. The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark and would like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. This episode concludes the second season of the podcast, but Donald and John will be back after a break to continue their investigation into the very best of what has been discovered and written about learning. Join us, won't you?